questions 11 through 20 on the 2021 grade 9 Pascal math contest. If A and B are positive integers, the operation triangle is defined by A triangle B is A to the power of B times B to the power of A. What is the value of 2 triangle 3? According to the definition, it would be 2 to the power of 3 multiplied by 3 to the power of 2. 2 to the power of 3 is 8. 3 to the power of 2 is 9. 8 times 9 is 72. Number 11, the answer is B. In the diagram, PQR is right angled at Q and has QPR as 54. Also, P lies on PQ such that PRS is equal to QRS. What is the measure of RSQ? Well, we can easily figure out those angles. That would be basically angle PRQ. That plus 54 plus 90 is equal to 180. So very quickly we can figure out that PRQ is equal to 36. And therefore since these are equal, each of those will be half of that 36. So 2, let's just call it theta. If 2 theta is 36, then theta is 18. So this is 18 right there. So now to figure out RSQ, well, RSQ, that would be that angle in there, RSQ. That plus 18 plus 90 is 180. So when you do that math, RSQ looks like it will be 72. And therefore, number 12, the answer is E. If m plus 1 is equal to n minus 2 over 3, what is the value of 3m minus n? m plus 1 is equal to n minus 2 over 3. 3m plus 3 is equal to n minus 2. 3m minus n is equal to minus 2 minus 3, and that is negative 5. And that's it. Number 13, the answer is B. A robot is placed on the grid. Shown, the robot starts on square 25, initially facing square 32. The robot moves two squares forward in that direction that it is facing, rotates clockwise 90 degrees, and moves one square forward in the new direction. Thus, the robot moves to square 39, turns and faces square 38, and then moves to square 38. The robot repeats the sequence of moves 1, 2, 3 two more times, given that the robot never leaves the grid on which square does it finish? Okay, so we where did we end up here? 38, right? Okay, so from that, let's just go through 1, 2, 3. 1 is going forward 2, so 1, 2. Then the next is you have to turn 90 degrees clockwise, so now we're going to be facing upwards. And then as you're facing upwards, you have to do uh, this number 3, which is move 1 square. So we're going to move to 29. Okay, now we got to do the same thing again. First thing, we're pointing in that direction, so we got to move 2 in that direction. Then from that, we have to turn 90 degrees, so that means we're going to be pointing that way. And then in that direction, we're going to move 1. And when you do, you end up at 16. So if you follow the directions properly, 16 is the answer. That means that would be choice A. Nate has a grid made of shaded and unshaded 2 cm by 2 cm squares as shown. He randomly places a circle with a diameter of 3 on the board so that the center of the circle is at the meeting point of 4 squares. What is the probability that he places the disk so that it is touching an equal number of shaded and unshaded squares? Well, it's a probability, so it's going to be something over something. And the denominator is the total number of choices. Total number of choices would be total number of, of uh, centers uh, that you can place. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. So I counted them out because I wanted you to understand that we're really looking at the centers being placed on any of those points because any of those points represents the center of four squares meeting point of four squares, which is how the question words it. Okay, now, 
how do we do it so that it meets the specific condition, which is what would go in the numerator? And that specific condition is that the um, circle will be touching an equal number of shaded and unshaded squares. Okay, well, I place it here. It does. An equal number of shaded and unshaded squares. Two unshaded, two shaded. Yes to this guy, but not yes to the next one, not yes to the next one, yes to this one. Yes here, yes here, yes, yes, but not the next one. No, yes here, yes, uh, yes again, I believe. And then no, 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 yes, yes, yes. And then finally, the last one, yes and yes. So how many is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 over 25. That is reduced to 3 over 5. Great. So number 15, the answer is E. An integer m is a perfect cube exactly when it is equal to n to the power of 3 for some integer n. For example, 1,000 is a perfect cube since 1,000 equals 10 to the power of 3. What is the smallest positive integer k for which the integer 2 to the power of 4 times 3 to the power of 2 times 5 to the power of 5 times k is a perfect cube? 2 to the power of 4, 3 to the power of 2, 5 to the power of 5 times k. For something to be a perfect cube, this has to be 3 or some multiple of 3. Well, this is obviously not 3, it's already 4, but I can make it a multiple of 3 by making it 6. To do that, I would have to add or multiply by, I should say, 2 to the power of 2. Let's talk about the next one. I've got to make this number a multiple of 3 for it to be a perfect cube. The smallest way to do that is to just multiply by 3 to the power of 1. And then when you add the exponents, it would become 3. And that is definitely a multiple of 3. How do I make this a multiple of 3? Well, I can make it 6 by multiplying by 5 to the power of 1. Then when you do, 1 plus 5 would be 6. So basically, that's what k is. And when you do, the, it would become, when you multiply this by this, let's just put that over here. So instead of k, we've sort of identified what k would be, 2 to the power of 2, 3 to the power of 1, and 5 to the power of 1. And this is, of course, the smallest k. I can make them bigger, but they're asking for the smallest. This would become 2 to the power of 6 times 3 to the power of 3 times 5 to the power of 6. All of them are multiples of 3, and therefore that is definitely a perfect cube. This is 4 times 3 times 5. What's that? Uh, 4 times 15, 60. So number 16, the answer is C. In the diagram, paths 1, 2, and 3 are drawn on a grid. Paths 1 and 3 consist entirely of straight line segments. Path 2 consists of a straight line segment and a semicircle. The length of path 1 is x, path 2 is y, and path 3 is z. Which of the following is true? Okay, so path 1 is x, this is y, and this is z. Okay, let's figure out what they are, and then we'll do the comparison. x, 1, 2, 3, 4, but be careful, these are not 1s, this is a diagonal. So 1, 2, 3, 4, so far, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I've got 8 that I can immediately count. But then this one and this one, I've got to do Pythagoras. So if this is 1 and this is 1, and this we'll just call it A, the length of that I can get with Pythagoras. A squared will be 1 squared plus 1 squared. So A squared will be equal to 2. A is root 2. And I've got two of them, right? i got this one and this one, so it's 2 root 2. So x is two, uh, 8 plus 2 root 2, and that's approximately 10.8. Okay, so let's figure out y and z. z, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So the 8 part I get immediately, and then I've got two diagonals. And those two diagonals I already figured out were each root 2. So two of them would be 2 root 2. And again, that's 10.8. It's the exact same as uh, x. Okay, so x equals z. So I can immediately eliminate a, d. Uh, well, I'm trying to get something with x equals z, right? It's there and it's there. So I, I'm going to eliminate those because I think it's between e and c. Now let's figure out why. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so I can count the 8 part. That's easy. But then I've got to figure out this curve here. 
Well, that curve, I'll write it down here, is the circumference divided by 2. And the circumference is always pi times the diameter. So it's really pi times the diameter divided by 2. The diameter would be from there to there. And that is, of course, just 2. So it would be pi times 2 divided by 2. So that's just pi. So that uh, half diameter or half circumference is what I meant to say is equal to pi. So that is, since pi is equal to 3.14, this is about 11.1, uh, right? 11.14. Okay, so that means x equals z. And z looks like it's less than y. Yeah. So those two combined are represented by choice C for number 17. Trains arrive at Pascal Station every x minutes, where x is a positive integer. Trains arrive at Pascal Station at many different times, including 10, 10 a.m., 10.55 a.m., 11.58 a.m., which of the following is a possible value of x. When you're going from 10.10 to 10.55, that is 45 minutes. So whatever x is, it has to be one of the divisors of 45. So 40, 45 is what? Uh, 5 times 9. And therefore, x is most likely going to be either 5 or 9. It has to be. It could be 3 also, but 3 is not one of the answer choices, so that's why I didn't talk about that. Then when we go from 1055 to 1158, again, we have to look at that. That is what, 63 minutes. So 63 is what, 7, seven times 9. Okay. So I see a 9 in common, so x can be either 5, 9, or 7. But it's got to be common to both, and the only number common to both is 9. So I can prove it. So it starts at 10, 10, right? So I'm, I've concluded that x is 9. So every 9 minutes, it's going to arrive at the station. So 10, 10, 10, 19, right? And you just keep adding 9. So it'll be 10, 28, 10, 37. 1046, 1055. And as you can see, 1055 was reached. And then similarly, if you keep adding 9 minutes like that, you eventually get to 1158 also. So therefore, number 18, the answer is 9, which is choice A. A group of friends are sharing a bag of candy. On the first day, they eat half a bag. Second day, they eat two-thirds of the remaining candies. Third day, they eat three-fourths of the remaining. Fourth day, four-fifths of the remaining. Fifth day, five-sixths of the remaining. At the end of the fifth day, there's only one bag, one candy left in the bag. How many candies were in the bag before the first day? Well, instead of dealing with X's and then half an X and all that stuff, right? You can do that, but I, I just went with the answer choices. But if you don't want to go with the answer choices, I'll just do it with X. So let's say at the very beginning, you had X candies. After day one, right? So day one, half of those candies are eaten. So you're left with X over two. After day two, uh, two thirds of the candies are eaten. So you only have one third left. So you have to multiply one third by this X over two. And then after the third day, uh, three-fourths of the candies are eaten, so you only have one-fourth left, so you have to multiply what's remaining by one-third. One-fourth, sorry, one-fourth. On the fourth day, four-fifths of the candies have eaten, so one-fifth is left, so you have to multiply what's remaining by one-fifth. And that would make it x over 2. And then on the fifth and last day of this, five-sixths of the remaining candies are eaten, so only one-sixth are left. So we have one-sixth that we have to multiply by to get what is remaining. So, and that, they're saying, is equal to one. Okay. So, six times five times four times three times two over is the uh, denominator. And I believe that is... 720. So when you cross multiply, x is 720. There you go. Number 19, the answer is B. Suppose that R, S, T are digits that n is a four digit positive integer, 8 R, S, T, and that n 
has a thousandths digit 8, hundreds digit R, tens digit S, and units digit T, which means that n is equal to 8,000 plus 100R plus 10S plus T. Suppose that the following conditions are true. The two-digit integer 8R is divisible by 3. The three-digit integer 8RS is divisible by 4. Four-digit integer 8RST is divisible by 5. The digits of n are not necessarily all different. The number of possible values for n is. Let's take this one step at a time. 8R is divisible by 3. Okay, well, that's a very limited choice. Two, a two-digit number that starts with 8 and is divisible by 3. So the only choices are 81. 84 and 87. These are the only three that are divisible by the number 3. Okay, let's keep going here. A three digit integer 8RS that is divisible by 4. 8RS is divisible by 4. If something is divisible by 4, its units digit, meaning that S, is going to be either a 0 a 4, an 8, a 2, or a 6, right? You can try that. Take 4 and keep adding 4. You'll get 8. Then you'll get 12, which gives a unit's digit of 2. Then you get 16, which gives a unit's digit of 6. Then you get 20, which gives a unit's digit of 0. And then you just repeat the same pattern again. Okay, and then a 4-digit integer that is divisible by 5, is if something is divisible by 5, it has to end in 0 or 5. So that means the T can only be a 0 or a 5. Okay, so let's make these numbers now. Let's just concentrate on the first two. And then whatever number we get for the first two, we just multiply by two since t has only two choices. It's either zero or five. Okay, so we got 81 with a zero, 81 with a four, 81 with an eight, 81 with a two, and 81 with a six. Okay, then we have 84 in a very similar way with a 0, 4, 8, 2, 6, 84. And then finally we have 87 with 0, 4, 8, 2, 6. So the first criteria is fine. Now we got to check the second criteria. Are these any of these numbers divisible by 4? And you're allowed to use a calculator and when you do, or you can do it in your head if you want, the ones that are divisible by 4 are the ones 8, 12, 8, 16, 840, 844, 848, 872, and 876. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Only 7 of them. And then each of those can be added to a 0 or a 5. So really it's 7 times this 2 would give you the total. And that is, of course, 14. So number 20, the answer is E.